So in this journey, we got people who want to go out and live in the woods forever. I mean, that seems to be everybody's dream as a kid. It's the reason I joined the military. It's the reason I did martial arts. It was all about being super woods ninja, right? When you finally get to a place, or as close to a place as you can get with that, let's say you have an amazing weekend. It's fall. There's all kinds of food on the trees and on the ground. You, you get lucky and get some fish and a squirrel with a throwing stick. It's the best weekend ever. And then suddenly it dawns on you, after six hours of building my shelter and getting a fire, I've already fished and hunted and foraged this place out. I got enough food for two weeks, but I gotta start this all over again. And dang, winter's coming. And that's when it hits like a lead balloon is. You can't do it on your own. Rambo doesn't exist, it's a fictional character. You could do it for a little while, maybe 20, 30 days, but even the scouts came back to their village. It takes a community of people who are aware, nature literate, plugged in with hard skills and soft skills, who are moving seasonally throughout an area. And this is where we hit a roadblock. Hunter, gatherer, nomadic. We're overpopulated now. We can't all go out on the land and forage and become like a blight or else we're going to live in a desert. And there's existing models to prove that out. You know, we used to have jungles all over the place in the middle of our planet. And when we gave people tools without birth control, <laughs> they started farming and staying in one place and their population exploded and their soils went away. So did ours in the 1920s. They called it the Dust Bowl. Right? It's happened historically, the cliffs of the Anasazi, the hanging gardens of Babylon and Iraq, and I'm not some you know, passionate environmental wacko. I'm looking at my backyard and going, how many deer could I manage here if I planted 36 apple trees? And maybe if I planted them so that they produced from June into November, maybe I could have enough deer to support a deer a month for my family. What can I do with the rabbits and the groundhogs? They're meat too, and raccoons. And since I'm on that, since I'm planting for food, apples and deer, I mean, there's a meal right there. <laughs> what about medicine? What plants are hardy enough that I don't have to spend all day in a garden weeding because they're rugged and they're more nutritious and they're just as effective as modern medicine? Like comfrey and stinging nettle and oak and beach. And maybe I'll plant them and won't see them because, you know, I'll be dead long before those black walnuts start producing, but the people who are here next will. And what does that mean for me in interacting with my own kind? You know, I want to make dang sure that whoever takes over this land knows what's been invested in the previous generation so they can continue on with that story of manifesting bounty. In short, if I'm not in this journey providing some opportunity to people to become part of a solution, no matter what problem they think is going on in the world, then I'm not doing them a service and I'm not doing my job. It's not about the doom and gloom. That comes. You don't have to look for it. It's going to find you. CNN, Fox News, talk radio. It doesn't matter what political affiliation. It's mostly doom and gloom. And then there's the commercials where they say, are you feeling depressed? Try this medication. It'll make parts of your body fall off, shrivel up, and cease to work. Ain't no leakages to be expected, but you may be happy. Now back to the news, right? So you don't need to go searching for that. What you, what you could probably benefit from is some options and opportunities to help resolve some of the tension that you feel when you come across those invisible walls or smacks to the back of the head. Hmm, grocery stores, pretty fragile system there. Or, hmm. Our, our primary source of food is rich in corn syrup, enriched flour, and is more addicting than heroin. Maybe I want to do something about that. What can I do about that? Okay. That's survival attitude. It's becoming proactive instead of reactive. So we have this, and this might help confirm some things. You might already know this, but this is my last bit. We have these degrees of evolutionary process. White belt, black belt. Boy Scout, Eagle Scout. Person who's first into your class, I want to learn it all. Big knives, coals, I want a fire seal bigger than a fire hydrant. Right? The new guy. Big saucer like eyes, super motivated, kind of annoying sometimes, is going to burn a hole in the carpet when they get home with their Motril set. 
That's just how it is. That's how we all are with it. Time to celebrate with that one. That East energy that inspired everything is new eyes, that's what's going to carry you through the rest. In the Southeast, it's pure mentoring. You find a friend who's interested in it too, and now you start hanging out with each other, and your skills start to explode because you have somebody to play against. Me and Chris Whitman for 25 years. Right? In the South, you become a specialist. And it's almost like it can come off as an arrogant type energy sometimes, but it's not. You're just a specialist. So somebody in the East is going to come up, hey, do you like bushcraft or outdoor skills? And I'm going to blah, 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 blah. They're just going 90 miles an hour. This guy? Well, yeah, it's all good, but particularly I'm interested in percussion flaking and uh, friction fire. The rest of it's all right, but and then that person goes off into the nuances of, you know, the double blindfolded leg drill or something weird like that. And we have specialists. We're really good at specializing. Out here in Western culture, it's not just you're a doctor. You specialize in teeth. Knees, ankles, ears, sinuses. So specialization, it serves us well. But it's also a, a frailty in the processes of all of the life around us. Who are the first to go? Who are the first to go extinct when an environment changes? It's the specialist. The generalists stay. So we're going to have cockroaches for a while. But where's the dodo? Where's, where are those giant birds in New Zealand and Australia? What happened to all those giant turtles? They became so highly specialized that when their environment shifted, they couldn't adjust and now they're gone. Right? So kudos to specialization. We need masters and craftsmen. But we also need generalists who are raised by villages of masters and craftsmen that have a lot of things. Right? The Southwest is a time to get out of the nest. Right? So people come through this program, they keep coming back, they keep coming back, and after a while they're gone. And I find out they're at roots or they're at Tom's, or they're at Wilderness Awareness School, or they're at, in Ohio with Dave. I used to be like, oh, what did I do wrong? Now they're like, oh, cool. They're in that space where they're going out to see what else is out there as a journeyman. And you still hear this language in the old guild construct of electrical work, carpentry, right? They're a journeyman. They're out striking it on their own, away from the shadow of their mentors. And they might even be killing their Buddha a little bit on their way, but that's, that's okay, that's to be expected and they're figuring out their own voice and what works and what doesn't for them on their walk. And they settle down, and it might be they come back, usually not, they start their own thing. They find their own niche, their own community, they end up finding a partner and getting married, but they start becoming their own entity with it, and they're in what we call the West, or the community building stage, right? So when I met Dave four years ago, or three years ago, the first thing that hit me was, this is a community. These people are here for something more than just skills. And you can see it. People around campfires, laughing, talking to each other, doing the King of the Hill thing with, you know, hanging out and sharing stories because they hadn't seen each other in a few months or years. It was powerful. That was definitely West End. You look at Dave now through my eyes, and I see somebody getting in touch with their ancestral past, with the Long Hunter stuff, you know, getting back to the, the period pieces of the people who had gone before, right? What did the people do here 1,500, 300, 1,000 years ago? And how could we implement that and incorporate that into our walk? Because they weren't stupid. They had larger craniums, and they had a better diet. And you know, i got to tell you, there's a learning curve that's more important when something's going to eat you or when your little ones are hungry, rather than a gold star or a poor card. Right? So they weren't stupid. <laughs> and that's what the Northwest is all about. I really can't talk to you about the North. I see it in Grandfather Ray. You know, his, his hair is white, he climbs like a squirrel, and he's in his late 60s, master guide for longer than I've been alive. And he holds this peace and, and sense of belonging that just calms everybody down. So I don't know what it's all about. I can look at it and say, that's what I want to be when I grow up, but I'm in no hurry to be there yet. You know? So there's this matrix then, uh, for me, and this is an artificial construct that drives this school. It's not the only way by far. But it's bring them through the Boy Scout stuff into and toward the Native stuff. Wean people off the dependency of, of tools. And then when, when they get that proficiency level, bring them back to those other tools with a new, a new sense of thankfulness and purpose. I don't know anybody who can do a bow drill and suddenly forget how to use a lighter. But everyone I know who can do a bow drill fully appreciates that lighter when it's in their hands. 
and it doesn't work the other way around. People who've never seen a bow drill and have only used lighters will mock you as you're trying to get that coal. Hey, you want to borrow my lighter? Or that ain't going to work. What are you doing? Yeah. We'll rub sticks together. Because it's not part of the reality, so it doesn't exist. Yeah. Right? That's it in a nutshell. That's it. When people come here, we're, we're ambassadors to something, and we don't know what it is for them, but something out there that's real and isn't defined by any, any other human being. And we just get step out of the way once it starts going. Hey guys, Brian from Snowwalker Bushcraft, and I'm up in Maine. I'm at the Maine Primitive Skills School. I'm up here with a couple of other instructors that we have here. I got Darren Barrett right here. He's going to come up and say hello. You know this guy, East Woodland Survival, right there. And then we got Jimmy Kane. Jimmy Kane's going to come over. We found Jimmy. Jimmy! Jimmy! <laughs> found Jimmy Kane. There he is, right there. Look at him. <laughs> and we got Chris Wick. He's over there changing because he won't come over right now because he's like half naked. Ah! So what this video is going to show you is a couple of different things that we learned while we were up here at the Maine Primitive Skills School. So hang in there. Sit tight. So right here, guys, one of the things that you can see right here is this big, tall plant. And this is known as comfrey. And this is your super healer plant. <laughs> Nice. Throw me off my game. It's a good thing I got an editing program. <laughs> you notice these leaves are very uh, long and slender, kind of uh, like a Clovis point. So it's a lancelet type leaf. The uh, entire stalk is a uh, semi square stalk, and they're covered in lots of little hairs. Right here, you can see it's deep veined in the back. And here's the leaf that's right here. Right now there is a purplish uh, flower head that's growing. And you can use this in salves. You can also use it in um, medicinal ways to uh, heal cuts and abrasions. And it will actually close up your wounds very quickly. Very difficult to find in the wild You'll find it on old, old growth areas, such as older farms and things of that nature. So that's common. Hey, so what we have here is we're actually going and we're taking a tour of the school. And this is the main communal fire pit that's at the school. And here we have the indoor, or the, I'm sorry, the outdoor uh, teaching center. And this is an outdoor classroom that most of the things are done in. Come in nice big blackboard different things to help you useful knots lashings talk about flint napping over here and then you're gonna have some projects that the students have been working on here or the apprentices and we have some bark containers Are you talking to pine bark? Yeah. Well, Permaculture people are calling comfrey a dynamic accumulator of nutrients. So, or a mineral miner is another term for it. So what it's doing is pulling up all types of minerals and nutrients from the soil, sometimes really deep down in the soil, pulling it up into the leaves. And here's a pear tree. We've got an orchard here with a bunch of different apple and pear trees. And I've planted comfrey around them in this uh, circle. And as the comfrey plants grow bigger, what we're going to do is we take some of the bottom leaves off that are big, crush them up, rip them up, and then we can put them around the base of the tree. And that's one of the ways we can use comfrey because it will leach the nutrients down into the soil. And as these comfrey plants grow bigger, this is just first year, as they grow bigger, there'll be a whole bunch of leaves we can pull off and put around here so it acts as a mulch, so weeds don't come up and compete with these young trees and as it rains and the nutrients break down, it'll go into the roots. So it's kind of like a cool little thing. We're real into like easy gardening, you know, and this is a way to set it up. Where I'm just walking through, take out a bunch of leaves, put it around there, um, and good things are happening with just a little bit of time. You know? so that's another great use of comfort.
what were all the medicinals really quick you were, you were talking about a minute ago? Yeah, so uh, there's more, I'm sure, than I even know. Comfrey is a, uh, it's a healing herb. It, it regenerates skin cell growth really fast. Uh, so with things like uh, lacerations, as long as they're not deep, um, scrapes, um, any type of injury that's not too deep, I use comfrey. And what I do is I just will pick off a young leaf or so, and I'll either crush it or chew it up, uh, depending on you know what herbalism place you've studied. Some people don't like the chewing because of the bacteria in the mouth. Other herbalists say oh, it's not a problem, it actually helps it. But whatever your philosophy is, I'll crush it up, I'll put it on the wound, and then you know I'll wrap it in something. And <clears throat> that works really, really well as long as it's not a deep wound. If it's like a puncture wound or a deep laceration, what will happen is uh, the skin will heal over so quickly from the comfrey that it will create an abscess underneath. So you don't want to do it for that. But um, any type of broken bone, heavily sprained uh, ankle or um, another joint that's been like really injured, um, taking comfrey root internally to aid with the healing. Uh, when Mike broke his neck, uh, we were giving him comfrey root massages externally, giving them comfrey root internally. And here's the disclaimer with comfrey, is take it at your own risk, do your own research with all of these plants that I'm talking about. The FDA uh, has released studies back in the 70s that um, say comfrey gives you um, liver cancer. And that's because they isolated the alkaloid in it, gave it in high doses to small rats over like a period of months, and then they de developed liver cancer. So it's kind of like, you know, do your own research, take your pick. I feel that it's safe, uh, used medicinally. I wouldn't drink it every single day. Um, I know a lot of old timers, especially up here in Maine, that eat the comfrey leaves, drink the comfrey root occasionally um, as a tonic, and they've never had any problems, so. When you make your, uh, your drink, are you doing a infusion? Or are you doing a decoction? Great question, I'm glad you asked. So, normally with roots, are I do Are you doing decoction. it hot or cold? Normally with roots, with all roots I do a decoction, however, comfrey is the exception to that rule. What I do with comfrey is, they're, they're not woody roots, they're kind of fleshy. So with woody roots I'm going to boil them, I'm going to simmer them in a decoction. With comfrey, since they're so fleshy and they're, you need to be gentle with them. So what I do is I chop it up, about a handful of good root, throw it into the mason jar, I cover that with about half an inch of cold water. Okay. And then I boil the water on the side and I'll pour it in. And so it's almost like a gentle infusion. It almost goes against most herbalism with, with, with getting the medicine from roots. Mm -hmm. um, I'll cap it, I'll wrap a blanket around it or a towel, mm -hmm. I'll let it sit overnight. So it's a very slow, gentle, long steeped infusion. And, um, and then I'll give it to the person who has a broken bone or something. Make sure that the bone is set before you start giving this to them. Because it will, it will start, it will start right. to heal that quickly. Right. Um, Very cool. Yeah, there's a million uses for comfort. Those are just some of them.